I don't know about you, but for me, I, I, I love the outdoors. I enjoy anything that includes being outside. As a kid, I used to love in, on a summer day or in the fall, I would literally explore back in our woods miles back uh, as a junior high kid to the point where I would almost be lost. But I would love to explore and adventure back in the woods all the way to the meadows back where we lived. I, I love the outdoors. I, I love in the springtime that first cut grass smell that you smell, knowing that spring is here or, or when those first blossoms come up and you start smelling the sense that spring is here. I love the mildew smell of a tent and the sound of the zipper of a tent that opens and closes because it brings back memories. I enjoy the outdoors. One of my favorite things is I, I would never, here's what's weird, I would never want to permanently move to the mountains, but I love the vacation there. Now, my wife and I are different. My wife loves to vacation on warm uh, beaches. I love to vacation in peaceful mountains. And so there's something for me that you hike up this trail and you sit on this overlook, this valley of these mountain ranges, and you just feel the breeze in your face. And there's something that for me, when I'm out in God's creation, it doesn't cause me to worship the things I see, but it humbles me and reminds me of how grand and majestic God is. That if God made all of this, then how grand and how amazing and big must God be? And so for me, there's something that's humbling and there's something that when I'm outside and I see his beautiful creation, there's just something that it does in my heart. It's something that brings rest. It also refocuses me and says, man, God's big. Look at, look at his handiwork. Look at all that he's done. Look what he has made. And so this morning what we're going to do is we're going to continue to look at this Genesis account of how did the world begin the origin of life and the universe. And so last week we really hit the first verse of that, Genesis 1-1. And now we're going to continue in Genesis. So if you're, again, if you have your Bibles, Genesis 1. And these next several weeks we're going to look at Genesis chapter 1 through 11. And look at these different parts in the scriptures where the Bible gives us answers to questions about the origin of life and the universe and the origin of time. And how humanity got here and it also gives us answers to what's the problem with the world that we live in? Was there a great flood? And, and how did we get the languages and the cultures that we have today? And so today I want to look again still more at the idea of origin and how did things begin? How did things come into play and into existence? And so if you guys have Bibles, read with me Genesis chapter 1. And we're going to read 1, 1 to 23. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And we covered that last week. The earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light was good and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the, water, the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven or sky. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas, and God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit, in which is their seed, each according to its kind. On the earth, and it was so, and the earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit, in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. And the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. 
And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the water swarm with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good and God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters and the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. So here we are, and we're going to stop there. Next week we'll continue the rest of that. But here is this Genesis account. Now some would say that, that Genesis here is, is poetry, Hebrew poetry. And it has some similarities to that, but I would disagree with that. I believe that it's a historical narrative. That throughout Genesis, as you read through, it's giving you this narrative of what is unfolded from the past. How things got into existence. And so here we are, if we go back to verse 2, where things begin. We, so we, we already saw in verse 1 last week that in the beginning, here's God who's always existed from eternity past, who always will exist. And that God created time, matter, and space right there. And he says, God created the heavens and the earth. And then it says, the earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So here's this, the earth is formed. There is no land that's been formed on this ball. But yet it's somehow this thing, that's, it's void, it's darkness, it's without form. But yet it's a ball of water. And, and, and the writer gives us this imagery of the spirit hovering over the waters. And so what's interesting is you see the Trinity, the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit at work in creation. Right? You have, you have passages like John 1.3 that says all things were made through him, referring to Christ or the Logos, the Word. And without him was not anything made that was made. Hebrews chapter 1 verses 2 through 3 says, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son. Whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And check out what it says. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Colossians 1, 16 and 17, also referring to Christ. It says, for by him all things were created. In heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And then Job 33, 4, which I don't think is on the screen, but it says, The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. And so here we've got the Father, we've got the Spirit hovering over the, in, over the waters, and it says that through the Word, the Logos, through Christ, all things were made. That somehow God, the Godhead, is the one who's put everything into motion, everything into existence. And so here's the universe, it, the heavens have been made, but yet the details of that have not been made yet. But the earth has been made, but it's still without form. It's consumed by water. There's no dry ground, and the spirit is hovering. And Isaiah 45, verse 18 says, For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, he is God, who formed the earth and made it. He established it. He did not create it empty. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is no other. So then he goes on in verse 3 of this narrative and he says, And God said, let there be light and there was lights. And so if you guys have a physical Bible or if you're good at uh, highlighting on your phones, I would encourage you guys, one of the things for me is I love to underline or circle repetitions when I read the scriptures. If you see a word that's repeated or a phrase, underline it, circle it, highlight it, because those are things that we probably need to pay attention to. 
So it starts out, it says, that God said, let there be light, and there was light. And we'll see this repetition over and over, that, that God creates light. He speaks, and out of his wisdom and out of his power, the echo that comes out and the sound waves that comes out of his mouth brings light. And so there's darkness, there's void, and yet all of a sudden there's this peak of light that starts to glimmer through. And so he says, let there be light, and there was light. God speaks it, God commands it, and there's action. And then verse 4. It says, and God saw that the light was good. God saw that the light was good. And you're going to see this repetition that over and over again, each day of creation, he's going to make something, and then you'll see that God saw that it was good. What does that mean, that he saw that it was good? It means it was pleasant, agreeable. It was the creator's evaluation and approval for all things in the universe that he's created. So in this essence, he's spoken and light comes into play. And he sees that it's good. That there's no regrets. There's nothing needed to be modified or changed to it. It's like an artist who looks at, his, at, at their canvas and this artwork that they're doing and there's no regret. There's no shame. There's nothing that's dissatisfied. They are fully happy, content, excited about the work that's been put out. And so God sees the light that has been put into play, and he sees that it's good. He's delighting in his work. He's pleased, and he's happy with his creative work. John Piper said that God rejoices in his works because his works are an expression of his glory. God rejoices in his works because his works are an expression of his glory. So here is light. He sees that it's good. And then look what happens next. He says, and God separated the light from the darkness. So he speaks, there's light. He separates the light from the darkness. And it's, now he calls it, he names it. So he speaks it. He sees that it's good. He separates it, and now he names it. And so what does he say? He says, God called the light day. And the darkness he called night, and there was evening, and there was morning the first day. God speaks it. He sees that it's good. He separates it, and now he puts it into play this first day and first night based on light and the separation of light and darkness. Now, here's something to think about for a minute. That word day, right, the, that last phrase, it says, and there was evening and there was morning the first day. Well, the, the issue that some people have when they look at Genesis, they would believe that a day could mean, uh, that did it really mean a 24-hour day period? Uh, did it mean the time that the sun rose and the sun set? Or does it mean something a longer span of time? And so some people would look at Genesis and they would conclude or they would make their assumption based on their preconceived ideas that it is a long period of time. And so they believe that day could mean for their evolutionary, evolutionary mindset to make it all fit. And so they would say that it is millions or thousands of years that there was this huge gaps between these periods of time. But I, I struggle with that idea because here's the thing. In the, in the Old Testament, the word day is said 2,301 times. And the majority of the times that the word day is used is in a literal 24-hour day period or a sunrise, a sundown period with the work day. And so to take, my, to take an assumption that says, oh, it must mean a longer period of time, I really look at this is meant to be a historical narrative giving us to, to, to see it literally. Because my problem I, I would have is, is if I start to fill in the gaps here to try to look into it something that, that it's not, if I see it as being this longer period of time and I begin to interpret it that way, then how do I begin to look at the rest of the scriptures? 
I think it starts to be a little faulty there. Because if there's room for interpretation in some of that to create my own assumptions, then what else in the scriptures do I want to pick and choose to make fit? And and so I would say that it's a 24-hour period that God is unveiling this first day that he makes light and darkness, day and night. So then we go on in verse 6. In verse 6, it says, And God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate. So here we go. We have the word said again. God speaks. God speaks. And he says, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God separated the light from the darkness. Now he wants this, this earth that's just consumed by water, now he wants to make a separation. In verse 7, it says, And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called it. Here's that phrase again. God called it. God named it. He called the expanse heaven or sky. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. So God speaks And he separates the waters, so now that we've got the sky and now we've got the earth. We've got the sky and now we have the the, the waters beneath. And it comes into play. That word, uh, the heavens, or another word is firmament. And that word firmament means it has a sense of something which is stretched out or spread out or beaten out. And so God speaks, and so here he stretches out this this waters above, the sky, the heavens above, that separates from the water beneath. All this happens in day two. So day one, light and darkness. Day two, the sky and the waters beneath. Again, by his wisdom and by his power, he needed nothing of material to build it. Because he is a source of all life. And so everything that we make is all because of material that's already been given to us. And yet God, in his power and his wisdom, needs no basis on which to create something, but from his own self and his own wisdom and power. And he speaks, and there it is. And then in verse 9, it says, And God said, Let the waters under the heavens... Be gathered. Let them be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed. Each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning the third day. Here God again speaks. He separates the waters now from, he he creates dry land. And so imagine the things, the, the earth is covered by water, and so what happens is imagine these mountain ranges starting to pierce through the water. And now you've got earth appearing. And there's ground, dry ground that God makes. And on that, he also makes living creatures, like not living creatures, lives plants that are to bear seed. But before we get to that, here's a little kid fact, fun fact we'll call it. The earth's surface is 28% land, 72% sea. Pretty cool. That God makes the land, and then on this land, he makes vegetation appear. He makes vegetation appear that, again, like we talked about last week, being the cause That here's these trees, here's this plant life that then can produce seeds, that then can produce new trees, new plants. You ever look around your yard? Like like this morning I was walking outside and and I've got all different types of trees. And just even in my feet are pine cones, acorns. 
How many have the maple trees that have the little helicopter seeds that fly down in the spring? Like God made that. The spring is beautiful. You ever drive by the streets that have all those um, pear trees or the cherry trees that are lined up by the sidewalks and you drive down and here's these pink flower petals that are flying down and the smells that are connected to that. What I love about God is that, here, think, have you ever thought about this? God could have made everything mundane. He could have made everything that we eat flavorless. Blah. He could have made the colors, everything black and white. But yet we, we have texture. We have smells. We can taste things. We can see beauty and colors. Like, if you think about some of the intricate detail that God put in place for our enjoyment, ultimately for his glory, but we get to enjoy. Like good art, when you see good art, you're like, you're, you're wowed by the artist. We live in, by the ocean. I think we take for granted what we see every day. When I drive home this time of year and I'm going home and it's already getting ready to be dark. And you go over the little Summers Point Bridge back in the AHT and you look at the power plant, but next to the power plant, which is the more beauty, you see this beautiful pink, orange, blue skies. It's God's handiwork. It's God speaking his art into motion. And so God speaks and so here becomes this beautiful artistry of the earth forming of the, of the grounds coming up and separating the waters. And so here are these trees and these bushes and these plants. And what's crazy is every single one of them are different. But yet the way they work with a seed that has to die. It has to die first. But then within this little seed it has everything it needs. That when given soil and water and some sunlight. Everything within that little tiny thing has enough for life to come out of it. You ever look at an oak tree leaf or a, a leaf and look it up closely with all the veins that run through it? One single leaf. Your yard has millions of them when they fall in the fall. And yet the detail of that one tree, that through that tree, here it's putting out. It's God's handiwork. God made it. God spoke it. But here's a question, is the earth really millions of years old or is it thousands of years old? You know, we look at the earth and we, you know, you have geologists and archaeologists and things that look at, find things in the ground and they look at the layers within the earth. And so a lot of scientists would say, oh, it's millions of years old. And there's a difference in our thinking there is because... An evolutionist would say, oh, it happened slowly over time. A creationist would say, no... The Bible actually can give answers to all of those same issues and problems. Their answer is that it was quick. Situations like a flood that could create those different channels and those different layers. And so check out this video for a second, and then we'll dive back into it for a few more minutes. Something to think about, right? A lot of our school systems always tell you everything's millions of years old, billions of years old. Uh, but what he's saying is that the way that which we rate the time of these rocks, it's an open system, inconsistent. So maybe it's a theory, but it's not necessarily true. The sad thing is a lot of our schools are not giving you the other side that is, in their mind will say could be true, in my mind will say is true, which is the fact that there's a creator. Someone who spoke and formed the earth. Situations like a flood that could come in and create, because of that working of that, or even like a volcano that can create these layers that, yes, from then on, the decay rate might be really long, but it doesn't define our past. Our past defines our present, not the present defining the past. Does that make sense? So let's close up with these last a few parts here. In verse 14. In verse 14, it says, And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens 
to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the nights and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. Here's what's crazy. If you you look, uh, the sun is 400 times larger than the moon. And the moon is 400 times closer to the earth than the sun is. It's the only scenario in which a satellite that's orbiting around a planet can lie, is, is perfectly distance apart, that that's why we get eclipses. That if any other planet that you were look at and the, the natural satellites that orbit around that planet will never line up what ours does. It's, it's the way that it's all specifically and intricately put together that it's the moon that gives us our seasons the till of the earth and how the moon orbits. All of those intricate details to me could not have happened by chance, by randomness, but rather God who is all wise and knew the exact angle and direction and distance that the earth must be from the sun or we would not be able to exist. No human life form or any type of life could exist if we were any closer or any further from the sun. If we were closer, it would be too hot. If we were further away, it would be too cold. God knew what he was doing. And so God creates the sun, the moon, the stars to rule the day and to rule the nights. And he says that he saw that it was good and it was the fourth day. In our last day here, verse five, or, or, um, day five, verse 20, it says, And God said, Let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good and God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters. In the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth, and there was evening, and there was morning the fifth day. And so here's, he say, here's the fifth day. He makes creatures to live within the water, and he makes birds to fly, feathered animals. And so this idea, if you look in verse 21, it says, So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves, with which the waters swarm according to their kinds. Well, what does that mean, to their kinds? Uh, it, you know, kind of what we would use the word species today. It's a little bit different than how an evolutionist would use it, though. Uh, kinds, biblical kinds. It's the idea that the species are fixed. Meaning that we might have different types of dogs, but we still, they're all in the dog family. They're all still within the same species. And so a lot of times evolutionists will say, well, look, well, because we have these different species, see, this is, this is evidence for evolution. But biblical kind is referring to that all stems back to a main kind that God made. Even if you look at Noah's ark. When everything was destroyed and two of every kind was put on the boat. boat, And after that, flood was to replenish the earth again. Well, we can narrow it all back to those same species. That if the way we got all these different so-called species of cats all come from still cats. They've never changed from that. Dogs still are within a dog family. Even though we have all these different types of dogs, they still all stem back from a dog family. The bear family, whale family, all of those things. So when you have its kind or their kind that he made them in, it's this biblical kind that all stems back that from there, this is how we have those different ones. I have chickens in my backyard. And each one of them are different, have these intricate patterns of these feathers. They all have these different colors or different kinds, but they all still come from the same family and realm of chickens. Listen, when I look at the scriptures, I really believe that the Bible does the best work of answering our questions of where we've come from and how we've gotten to where we've gotten. 
And I know for a lot of people, it's more of the issue of the idea that a God that you cannot see exists. But both of them take faith, whether you believe in evolution or whether you believe in creation. The problem is, is I believe that Christianity and biblical belief isn't just a leap of faith. I don't believe it's a blind faith. I believe that when I see the accounts in the scriptures, it gives me the most answers to the questions I have in how I see the world. And so I don't know about you, but I, I love watching nature shows. Uh, BBC has uh, these nature shows that I love, and um, I forget what the one narrator's voice is, but he's got an English accent, and my kids hate it because they know if I put it on, that means it's nap time. Because the guy's got the most soothing voice. I lay there with the beautiful colors on the screen, and I just pass out. But I can listen to those videos, even though the narrator's saying that these things are millions of years old and billions of years old, I can look at it and enjoy the beauty that I'm watching on the screen with a biblical worldview or a biblical perspective that I can discern what he's saying, saying, no, it's not millions and billions of years old. And it's not evolved, it's God made it. And I can look at those things and take a nap and wake up and still enjoy some more and glorify God in all the intricate details and beauty that I've seen because God is the one who formed it. He's the one that made it. And just like we said last week, if God made it and we're not here by chance, then that means we have purpose and we have value. Because if there's no maker and there's no creator, then we have no purpose, we have no value, there is no reason for our existence except to just live how we please and only live for self. And so we're going to talk more next week on how God created mankind and his image and what that looks like. My hope is as you drive home today and this week, that you would slow down and look at the intricate details that God has put in place and worship him for it. Here's what's crazy to me. God has put those same excellent details in areas that no human being will ever see. So yes, we get to enjoy it. Yes, it's somewhat for our pleasure. But that's not the ultimate reason. And God in his glory made it for his glory. And there's intricate details around the world and the universe that we will never see. But it's still God's handiwork and all the beauty that's connected to it. This same God who made the universe is the same God who loved you and died for you. Would you stand with me as we close? For some of you, maybe you've been living in a world and living with the mindset that, yeah, we've just evolved and we're here by chance. And maybe you're wrestling with the idea, is there really purpose to my life? And my hope that today is that maybe your mind is open a little bit. Maybe your eyes are open to say, maybe would you consider the idea that there is a God? There's just a creator. Would you consider the idea that maybe this God can be known? We can know that he exists through creation, but he's also made himself known personally. He's made himself known to the fact that he would become his own creation and take on human flesh so that he would die for humanity, pay for the sins that we've committed. Where we've wandered in this world kind of blindly, hoping, longing for, groping for something that will give us a value and purpose and hope. And Jesus shows up in the scene, God in the flesh, to awaken our eyes, to bring us hope, to bring us salvation, to bring us purpose and reason for living. And so that we can know our creator from the day that we put our faith in him and for all eternity and enjoying his good pleasures. His name is Jesus. He's God who came in the flesh. He died on the cross for your sin and my sin. He rose again three days later so that if you would decide to turn your life from sin, put your trust in Jesus Christ, asking him to forgive you of your sins and to come into your life, it's through that faith in Jesus that he restores you to a right relationship with your creator, with God, and where you can know him and you can call him father and you can enjoy him forever. My hope and my challenge is that you would consider that truth. 
that you would accept that truth in your life and say yes to Christ. And I close you with that.